I want to invite you this morning to open in your New Testament to John chapter 20 as a beginning place. John chapter 20. When I read the New Testament, one thing that is interesting, one thing that stands out to me is how little we're actually told about what took place in the first century. I want you to think about it for a moment. We know really only a handful of details about the events surrounding the birth of Jesus or about the early years of his life. We know maybe a little bit more about the last three and a half years or so of his life upon the earth when he was publicly preaching and teaching. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all record many of the same events during this period of time. And John tells us here in John chapter 20 that Jesus actually did many more things than he recorded. You see in verses 30 and 31. He says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, believe, by believing you may have life in his name. And so there's a lot of things that Jesus did that we just don't have recorded for us. We, we probably know the most about the last week of his life. There's more information in the Gospels that have to do with that last week of his life before he was crucified than any other point in time. On the whole, we have mostly just kind of a summary. You can say the same thing, I think, about the rest of the New Testament. We know almost nothing about most of the apostles. We know a little bit about the apostle Peter, and we maybe know a little bit more than that about the apostle Paul. But on the whole, there's not a whole lot revealed about these men in the New Testament, at least not about the details of their lives. You read the names of a few people. They show up here, they show up there, but typically not a whole lot is said about them. And the New Testament was never intended to be an exhaustive historical account of the life of Jesus nor his disciples. Uh, the Lord gave us what we need to know, not necessarily everything we might like to know, all the details we want to have filled in. You know, Paul would say in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And that's why we have what we have in the Scriptures. It's designed to accomplish that purpose, and what we have in the Scriptures is sufficient to, to fulfill that purpose. Well, in our lesson this morning, I want us to talk about a man. I'm just going to put it this way. I want us to talk about a man concerning whom we know almost nothing. That, that sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? A man by the name of Demas. And his name actually appears a total of three times in the New Testament. Most of those, or a couple of those, are just sort of in passing. And yet, I, I think we can profit from what is said about him. There's some things that we can learn from the brief references that are made to him. And that's what I want us to try to do this morning. Uh, there's really no way for us to piece together the entire story of Demas from just the brief references that are made to him in the New Testament. But there are a couple of things I think we are able to say about him. And the first is that the Demas was one of Paul's trusted companions at one point in time. Uh, his name is listed among Paul's other helpers in each of the places where it appears in the New Testament. And we may be a little bit more familiar with some of the other men that Paul worked with, people like Mark or Luke or Timothy or Titus. You know, they get books that have their names on them. But there were other men who also worked with the Apostle Paul who maybe are not as well known to us. You read about Aristarchus and Tychicus and Epaphras and Epaphroditus and Crescens and even, even a man named Jesus who was called Justice. Well, Demas may be among those lesser known companions of Paul, but he worked among those who worked with Paul in the preaching of the gospel. And when you take into consideration the point in time when each of Paul's letters was written, it seems that Demas worked with Paul during his first imprisonment in the city of Rome. Luke doesn't record much about Paul's first imprisonment in Rome except at the very end of, of the book of Acts. He will tell us that, that Paul was there for two years and that he was permitted to see the people who came to him. He, he wasn't denied any visitors. And so we learn maybe a little bit more about Paul's first imprisonment in Rome when we read the letters that Paul wrote while he was there. He wrote Ephesians when he was there. He wrote Philippians when he was there. He wrote Colossians when he was there. He wrote the short letter to Philemon when he was imprisoned in Rome. 
And one thing you find is that although Paul may not have been entirely sure uh, what was going to happen with him when he was imprisoned, he was fairly confident about things. And so in Philippians chapter 1, for example, in verse 19, he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I, am to, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. And my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. And so he didn't know for sure, but he was fairly confident that he would, he would be released. And evidently, that's what took place. After all, Luke tells us that Paul's incarceration was for a, a, a full two years. Uh, he was evidently set free after that fact. It, I find it difficult to believe that if he had died at, that, at the end of those two years, that you know, Luke wouldn't say something about that. So Paul was evidently released. And, and during the time that Paul was confined in Rome uh, to his rented quarters there, what he did is he used some of the men that I mentioned earlier in order to help him in his work. Uh, he couldn't physically go and visit the churches, but he could send people for those purposes. And so in the letters that he wrote, we read about Paul sending Epaphroditus with the letter that he wrote to Philippi. And the fact that he planned to send Timothy to them at some point. We read about uh, him sending Tychicus with the letter to the church in Colossae and also uh, about sending Mark to them as well in the letter that he wrote to Colossians, to the Colossians. Paul kept a, a few men close by to him at all times, it seems. And so Demas was apparently one of those who, who remained with the apostle Paul at, at certain points and assisted him at times when he was incarcerated in Rome. And so Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, uh, as Paul's kind of wrapping things up, he, he says to the Colossians, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and so forth. He's here and he's sending his greetings to you. And so although Paul was both loving and caring, I, I get the feeling that he was not afraid to work people. Uh, he was not about to sit around and feel sorry for himself because he was incarcerated in Rome, especially because there was a lot of work that needed to be done. And so from what is said in the New Testament, he showed no hesitation whatsoever in using these men that we've been talking about to carry on the work while he was detained. Demas was one of those men. Despite the fact that Paul was imprisoned for doing this very work, Demas was involved in, in doing the same thing. In fact, I can't help but wonder if Paul had people like Demas or Demas and others in mind when he wrote in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14 that most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They know I'm in prison. They know I'm in prison for preaching the gospel. And yet they are, have been emboldened to go out and to do the same thing. Uh, they didn't allow Paul's chains to keep them from engaging in the work. And if that's all we, had, had, all we saw in the New Testament about Demas, if that was the sum total of what we read about him, the only picture we would have is of a man who was a fellow worker of the Apostle Paul, one of his trusted companions. But there's another reference to Demas in the New Testament that I want us to look at. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And 2 Timothy is the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote that we have available to us. If you were to lay them out chronologically, this is the last one. And in this letter, Paul says, beginning in verse 9, he tells Timothy, he says, Do your best to come to me soon. Timothy was going to have to come to him because he's imprisoned. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. And gone to Thessalonica. Let me take just a moment to give you a little bit of background information surrounding those words. As I said earlier, Paul was evidently released after he spent two full years in his own rented quarters in Rome. He was detained. He couldn't go anywhere, but he could again accept people who came to him. He was, he was incarcerated, but he wasn't actually in a prison. 
And so Paul was released after, after that two years, and I think that's implied in, in the words of Luke. And so there's a period of time following Paul's release that Luke doesn't record in the book of Acts. He doesn't tell us anything about what Paul did after he was released from uh, his incarceration in Rome. But apparently Paul was arrested once again. And he was taken back to Rome. He was imprisoned there a second time. And Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, just like his first imprisonment, would have been under the reign of Nero. And the difference is that his second imprisonment was most likely after the burning of Rome in A.D. 64. It was rumored that Nero himself had set fire to the city, tried to divert attention from his poor leadership by doing that. And yet he blamed the Christians for that fire and he persecuted them. And although the New Testament says nothing about these things and talk about that kind of thing, early church history tells us that Paul was one of those who was killed during that time of persecution. And Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy during that second imprisonment. And it is obvious when you read the the things that are found from the letters from his first imprisonment and what Paul says here in this letter that is during his second imprisonment that the circumstances are different. Rather than making statements like, I'm confident that I'm going to be released, Paul was certain that the time of his death was near. It's when he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, I suffer hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. And then a little bit later in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. The tone is just different. Just as when Paul was in prison the first time, he relied upon certain men to keep on with the work. And that's why in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, he talks about the fact that he had sent Crescens to Galatia and he had sent Titus to Dalmatia. They are to carry on with the work that he could not physically do because he was in prison. But Demas is different this time. We're told he had gone to Thessalonica, but it's not because Paul sent him there. It's not because he was involved in the work. Paul said Demas in love with this present world, has deserted me. The word Paul used there to describe the actions of Demas are the the same ones that are used in Mark's translation of the the words of Jesus when he was upon the cross, when it says in Mark 15 and verse 34 that at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. And it says, which means, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? And the point I'm making is that Demas had completely abandoned. He had completely forsaken Paul in his greatest hour of need. And the question I have is how could he do something like that? I mean, Paul Paul gives us the reason. He says there again in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10 that he was in love with this present world. And, And I don't think that necessarily means that Demas said, you know what, I'm out. I'm not a Christian anymore. I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't even think it necessarily means that he he took the approach of, I'm going back to living a a sinful lifestyle. I'm not going to live uh, in in keeping with the principles that that God has outlined. The The world that Paul was talking about in this passage is not the one made up of dirt and water. Paul was saying that Demas loved this present age. In contrast with the age to come, he valued what is here and what is now more than he did what awaits the faithful child of God in the future. And and you can read about those things in in 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you take just a moment to go over there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, beginning in verse 6 and following, Paul would talk about himself. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was looking forward to the age to come. And then he, just after saying that, a couple of verses later, he says, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. He's not one of those who's looking for the return of the Lord. He's looking for the here and the now. And I can't help but wonder if Demas deserted Paul in this instance, because it's just too dangerous. Things are are getting bad. It's not easy to live as a Christian in Rome at this point. Paul's not just incarcerated, he's in prison and he is about to die, and I'm not willing to do that. I don't know if Demas ever got his priorities straight. 
Truth is, the New Testament doesn't say anything about that one way or the other. This was Paul's last letter, and Demas certainly is not the focus of it, so it's not like we should expect that we would get to see more about his condition. We will never know what happened to him, at least not as long as we remain in this world. The Lord chose not to reveal that to us. But one thing we can do as we look at what we know about Demas is I think we can take to heart a few lessons that we can learn from his life. And so I want to suggest three things this morning based upon what we've been talking about. And the first lesson that we can learn is that we must count the cost of being disciples of Christ. I think that's ultimately the problem with Demas. You know, Jesus was never unclear about what being one of his disciples would require. Did you, have you ever noticed that when reading through the Gospels? Do you remember how Jesus would, would respond to people who, who followed him and yet were just kind of casually following him? In Luke chapter 14 and verse 26 beginning, as great crowds accompanied him, we were told in verse 25, it says that Jesus turned to him and he says this beginning in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate with uh, whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace." So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Demas didn't count the cost. He didn't follow through. He's like the guy who starts to build the tower and doesn't finish it because he, did, he, didn't, he didn't know what it was going to take to get it all the way to the end. Jesus lays down the terms of discipleship right from the start, and he encourages people to count the cost before accepting the call to be one of his disciples. Are you going to be all in or not? You have to determine that. There's one area where it seems to me that Christians, I think, fall short of the demands of the New Testament. It's with our willingness to endure hardship for the cause of Christ. I mean, we, we know what Jesus said, and, and we know what, what Paul would say in the, the second letter that he, he wrote to Timothy. He would talk about uh, those very things. For example, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, he would say to Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He, he would say to him in the, very, the beginning of the next chapter, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He would say a little bit later, down in verse 11 of that same chapter, this saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Or in chapter 3, in verses 10 and following, Paul says to Timothy, you, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse. Do you think we ever look at passages like these? And think, you know, all that stuff just kind of belongs to another time and another to do with us and the world we live in and what we're supposed to do as Christians. We just need to go to Bible class. We ought to be willing to, you know, serve the Lord and put up with a reasonable amount of discomfort. I mean, the sermon might go five minutes long. And that's just horrible to deal with. But we don't think we have to take it too far, right? Would we do any better if, we, if our lives were being threatened like they were in the first century? 
You know, Demas was not the last person to do what he did, and he certainly was not the last person to be tempted to do so. In fact, when I read what Paul said to Timothy, I can't help but wonder if there were perhaps some similarities between Demas and Timothy, at least with regard to their personalities. Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, at least in part, I think, to encourage him, don't follow in the footsteps of of Demas. Be willing to suffer. Be willing to endure. Do whatever you have to do. Demas wasn't. You be different, Timothy. I don't know that Timothy was naturally courageous. I'm not sure many people are. And that's why it's important that we count the cost and determine that we're willing to see things through to the end, regardless of what we encounter. It's important that we do that. But the second thing I think we can learn from the life of Demas is that we can't really rest on past accomplishments. I don't I'm not saying that I think that's what Demas was doing, that that's the process that was going on in his mind, but I think that's still something that's taught in this. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be counted among Paul's fellow workers? Can you imagine what it must have been like to be considered one of his trusted companions? That's what Demas was at one point in his life. He was useful to Paul in the work of the gospel. And I don't know precisely what he did. We're not given any details about that. But the very fact that Paul listed him as one of his fellow workers says something about the kind of man that Demas was at one point in his life. And yet he gave all of that up. In essence, he quit. And and Paul didn't say about that. He said, you know, know, Demas was here during my first imprisonment. And, you know, maybe he's done his part. And and it's maybe someone else needs to step up now. And it's time for him to kind of retire from the work. Paul clearly expected Demas to be there as long as someone needed to be there, didn't he? You know, it's hard to accept that kind of assignment, isn't it? We don't want to be the ones who are always called upon to bear the burdens and do the work. We want other people to step up and do their part so that we can sit down and rest. But we, we didn't get that from the scriptures. Certainly not the kind of thing we read about in the letters of Paul. In his mind, the only retirement from the Lord's work was at the point of death. In, in, in Philippians, when he talks about, you know, There's two options here. I may depart and I may be with Christ. He says, if I go on living, it just means fruitful labor for me. (laughs) There's no other option. There's not like a plan B. It's not like, well, I I can either, I'm either going to be put to death or I'm going to be released and I'll do more work or possibly I might retire a little bit early. That wasn't it. Do you think God expects anything different from the rest of us than he did from Paul? We're not going to be able to rest on past accomplishments. We're going to be able to say, yeah, good enough. I've done my part, and and now I'm going to kind of take it easy. It's not what this life is for. And the third lesson I think we can learn from the life of Demas is that we must love the world to come more than we do this present world. Isn't that what we've been called upon to do? And yet how difficult it is for us to actually do that. I'm not sure that there is a temptation that we face or a struggle that we endure that doesn't ultimately come back to that issue. I'm not sure what Paul meant when he said that Demas had deserted him because he loved this present world. Again, if I had to guess, I'd say that he was concerned about his safety in this world more than he was his security in the world to come. I know that Jesus warned about adopting that kind of approach to life, and the reason he did so is because he knew that it would be a challenge for his disciples. And so he would say in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 that anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will will find it. And he asked the question, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or, Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. There's the challenge. We can have, you know, we can either focus on the what we have in this life or what we're going to have in the one to come, but but really we're going to have to make a choice. There's going to have to be a priority there. It's not both. It's not, I'm going to get everything out of this world and then I'm going to hope to get everything out of the world to come. We have to make a choice. How many people do you know in people who claim to be Christians who live their lives as though what happens in this world is the most important consideration. How many people? The problem with mankind has always been basically the same. 
Do, do you remember why the children of Israel kept going back into idolatry? One reason is because the idol provided, provided them with the God they could see. And, and we look back on that and we think that's just completely ridiculous. And it is. And yet I'm convinced that we sometimes suffer the same basic problem. We give our time and we give our attention to what we can see rather than to what is invisible. And what made Paul different than Demas and different than us at times was his ability to put everything in perspective. I want to read something he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, begins in chapter 4 and breaks into chapter 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. Paul says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, some translations say. But the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, you want to know what your tent looks like, just look in the mirror. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, these bodies, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. What is he, what's he saying? Here we are. We're in this tent. We groan at times about it and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, we may be here and we may live now, but we had better be living for then because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what Paul says. Look to the future. Live your life accordingly. As we bring things to a close, I'm going to ask you a question. Where, where's your focus, would you say? Do you live from day to day? Have you been so caught up in the present world that you've not given much thought to the one to come? Not only is that dangerous, Jesus said it's deadly. Because we've been, we've been called upon the count, to count the cost of following him. And we can't afford to rest on the, the work that we've done at some point in the past. We need to live each day of our lives like people who believe that Jesus is coming again. Like people who love his appearing more than they do this present world. So I want to ask you, is that how you're living? If not, then learn a lesson from the life of Demas. Make whatever changes you need to make. Don't follow his example. Follow the example of people like Paul, those faithful servants who looked to the future and who endured to the end and who will be rewarded for that very fact. If you're here this morning, we can help you in some way. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. That, that's the place to begin. That's where you start. It's not an ending place. That's the, that's the beginning of the race. And if you've been running along kind of haphazardly in that race, being enamored by the things that are around you. It's time to focus on the goal. And if we can help you to do that, we can help you to get on track and stay on track. That's what we want to do. That's why we're here. We help one another. If we can do that for you this morning, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.